you know, less than two weeks ago since we were discussing Sony's release of the remastered A7R 3 and R4, of which they just seemingly replaced the screen and that was it. But has Canon now done the same thing? No. That surprised the fanboys, didn't it? Hey, bet you came here expecting some out of proportion scathing attack on Canon. No, I'm not as much of a bastard as some people like to think. Now, I appreciate there's probably a couple of people out there who aren't aware of the announcement that's been made by Canon and are wondering what the hell I'm babbling on about. A couple of days ago, Canon announced, along with the new RF 100mm macro lens, they announced their first super telephoto, no, not first, that's a load of crap, their first L-grade super telephoto, a 400mm f2.8 LIS and a 600mm f4 LIS. You're probably familiar with those focal lengths and apertures because they've done several versions of them for DSLRs over the years. And now they're bringing those lenses to the RF system. And that announcement married up beautifully to their other announcement, which was confirmation that they are developing an R3, which is going to be a more flagship pro-level Canon mirrorless body to rival the likes of the Z9, the A9 and the A1. Sounds fantastic, except upon viewing these new RF lenses, my initial thought straight away was, these look very familiar. They look very, very similar to the Canon EF Mark III versions. And the reason for that is quite simple. They are the Canon EF Mark III versions. Basically, what they've done is taken the lenses that they released in 2018 and have slammed an adapter onto the back of them and are now launching them as RF lenses. But the main bulk of the lens remains exactly the same. It's exactly the same optical design, near enough exactly the same weight. It's just a built-in adapter to pre-existing lenses. And the reactions that I've seen from people do seem to be quite mixed. From the various articles that I've read and numerous different comment sections, there are some people that think it's a brilliant move and other people think it's a bit of a cop-out on Canon's behalf. And I will be honest, my very first impression upon initially realizing that they just basically adapted the EF lenses was that's a bit of a dick move. Only for a second though, until I actually processed it and thought about it and realized, to be fair, it's a smart move that makes perfect sense. There are one or two small aspects that I'm a little unsure about, but overall, I do think it's a wise decision. Obviously, developing and designing lenses takes a hell of a lot of effort and time and resources to do. Now, if you look back over the history of Canon's four and 600 millimeter lenses, they don't replace them very often. They've gone through three versions in about as long as I've been alive. They, they tend to keep them on the market for a good close to a decade, probably. So they're not updated very often, and it's only been three years since they last released them. So it would take a hell of a potential improvement over the Mark III EF lenses for them to justify sinking all those resources all over again into developing a brand new lens for RF. Now, obviously they could have done that. They could have just gone, right, scrap the EF and let's start from the ground up, back to the drawing board and make a whole new lens from scratch for RF. But in reality, even if they'd done that, I don't think the lens would fundamentally be that much different to what they already have. Around the same time that Canon released those four and 600 millimeters back in 2018, Sony released their own 4 and 600 millimeters for their E-mount mirrorless system. And if you actually compare up the two manufacturers' lenses, you can see that they're not actually that much different. The weights of them were around about the same, although from memory, and I might be wrong on this because I'm not bloody Rain Man, but the Canons were actually a fraction lighter than the Sony's because the Sony had a slightly longer body. 
And both of them adapted the same sort of philosophy in the optical design, which is to try and put as much of the glass towards the back of the lens as possible. Traditionally, in those sorts of lenses, you would have a huge amount of glass at the front of the lens, and that would make the lens very front heavy. By moving all the glass to the back, you not only move the center of gravity closer to the camera body where you're holding it, but also the glass elements can be made smaller, so the weight of the lens is reduced as well. But the weights of the two lots of lenses were very, very similar. And the other argument that often gets put forward for mirrorless over DSLRs is the physical size of the lens. But again, the lenses between Canon's EF and Sony's E-mount of the 4 and 600 mil are actually very similar to each other. In fact, the Sony's is slightly longer. And the reason for that is the advantage of a shortened back focus, a short flange distance, only becomes actually a benefit when you're dealing with wider angle lenses. For a wide angle, it works having the optics closer to the lens because the points of convergence are gonna be much closer to the sensor. So you don't have a huge big air gap to try and have to work through. But once you get into longer focal lengths, that gap becomes irrelevant anyway. So while mirrorless has a clear cut advantage dealing with wide angle lenses and arguably systems as a whole, when it comes to long telephoto lenses, there's no benefit whatsoever in terms of the physical size of the lens. So even if Canon had redeveloped a four and 600 mil from the ground up for mirrorless, I don't actually think it would really be any different than the EF lenses that they already have. And, and in reality, Canon have not just taken the EF lens and stuck an adapter onto the back of it, because any sod could do that. Now, the job of the adapter is essentially to act as an interpreter between a DSLR lens and a mirrorless body and make sure they can understand each other. But that then presents a bottleneck. So Canon will have not just adding an adapter onto the back of a pre-existing lens, they will have changed all the firmware so that the lenses can now talk fluently with a mirrorless system. The bit I did find amusing about that though is the fact they've made no attempt to hide the fact that they've fundamentally added an adapter onto the back of the lens because they've not even painted it white to blend in with the body, they've painted it fucking silver. Now, along with the inevitable firmware changes that will have happened for the autofocus system, they have seemingly added another aspect to autofocus that should, in theory, improve it over the DSLR variant. Now, I can't remember what they call this system, but fundamentally, it's adding another power pin onto the back of the lens so that it can draw more power from the camera body to better drive the autofocus motor so that you should get faster autofocus performance. Whether that actually makes a difference or not though remains to be seen because it's fair to say that the EF variants were pretty damn quick already. The only aspect of the autofocus though that, that concerns me, obviously I know Canon know what they're doing, but I can see no mention that they've changed the fundamental autofocus motor. It seems to still be a ring type USM that they used in the EF variants. Now, where this raises some confusion for me is that, as far as I can tell, all of their RF lenses are either STM or the ones that are USM aren't ring type USMs like they traditionally used in DSLRs. It's nano USMs. Now, when Canon released nano USM lenses for DSLRs, of which they only released two, three, not very many, but their big selling point that they tried to push was the fact that ring type USMs work great for the phase detect systems of DSLRs with a separate autofocus chip, but they're not so good when using sensor-based autofocus like their dual pixel AF for live view and video. The STM motors were much smoother and better for that, but they weren't as quick. The nano USMs were supposed to be a perfect hybrid between the two, giving you very fast autofocus and very smooth autofocus. And that was advertised as part of the 100mm macro release. 
the fact that it uses, I think it's got dual nano USMs for lightning fast reactions. But from what I can tell, they've not changed the EF lenses to be single or dual nano anything. It seems to be that they're still using ring type USMs. So that makes me wonder how well are these lenses actually going to perform on a mirrorless body? Is that why they've had to add these new power lines to it? To, because they needed the extra power? From what Canon have said, this new R3 is gonna shoot 30 frames a second. Are the lenses gonna be able to keep up with that? I don't know, but it's definitely something I'll keep an eye out for when the reviews start hitting. I imagine if they have stuck with ring type USM, the reason being is that that's the only thing they've got powerful enough to drive one lot of autofocus elements. I don't think a nano USM motor would have enough grunt to be able to autofocus such a big lens on its own, which is why presumably Sony usually go with the dual linear motors. But then the whole lens would have to be designed around that concept and would force a change in optical design, which would force the lens being designed from the ground up. Who knows, all will become clear when the reviews hit the market, but for now, at least, given the fact the Olympics are coming up, R3's on the horizon, I do think it was a smart move from Canon to ensure that they've got RF compatible native super telephoto lenses ready to go, and this would be the quickest, easiest way to do it. Even if in a few years time we do see them release a Mark II variant employing dual nano USMs or some new form of autofocus system they're working on. Or maybe they won't, and maybe this lens works perfectly fine with mirrorless. Who knows? But that's just my thoughts and opinions on it. What do you make of these new announcements? Leave your thoughts and comments in the box down below while you're down there. If you haven't already and you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button, and then hopefully we'll see you in the next video. You and your damn tail. Oh,